this circuit has a switch. So uh, when the switch is open, we should compare these circuits with that one and choose the correct answer. And another situation when that switch is closed, and again we have to answer the same question, which of these circuits is going to be equivalent to the original one. And these are all the possibilities, all the options, all the first, all the second, all the third, first and second, second, and, well, first and third, second and third, all of them or none. All right. So the switch is open. Which of those circuits would be equivalent? Let's keep it this way. 
So this wire, I can just bend it and I can arrange my resistor like that. Now, again, these are just wires. I can bend them in a way I like and rearrange two following resistors. It doesn't change the current anywhere. Basically what I'm doing, I'm taking these two and physically move them. The lab you're doing this with involves boxes and wires. And it's up to you how you <coughs> arrange the boxes. As long as the connection stays the same, the circuit is you know, the same as before. So these two circuits are equivalent to each other. Or we could take this circuit and, for example, flip it over. <coughs> it doesn't matter. It doesn't change any connection. <coughs> so uh, here, if you look at this part, it's exactly like that part with the closed switch. Same here, same here. But the last circuit looks differently just because we rearrange the order of elements. In this circuit, a single element comes first, and then two in parallel after that. In this circuit, two parallel resistors come first, and this after. But it doesn't matter, because the equivalent resistance is the same again. Well, again, assuming all resistances are equal. So they all equal to each other, physically. <coughs> well, one more preview question in the last one. So we will be sad we did it kind of on Monday. So, Remember an experiment with valves. Now what we see here, exactly the same uh, kind of schematics. What we know is different. We know the current through the battery. We know the voltage across this bulb. And we know the resistance of this bulb. When the switch is open. So the first question is, if I close the switch here, what's going to happen to this voltage? These are possible answers. Nothing is happening, it's still 24. Or the voltage goes up, or the voltage goes down. So the switch is open. The voltage is 24. The switch is closed. What's going to happen to the voltage? Did it blink green? Yes? Okay, so I don't want to scare you. I just 
just want to remind you next Wednesday the test is coming. So in order to be prepared for the test, you need to know in general, not just, uh, well, of course you have to solve all the homework problems, but you need to know how things work in general. And that's how they work in general. Thank you very much. Sorry, don't know everybody's name. I don't know anybody's name. But uh, it's right. That's how we have to think. What's the difference? Well, first of all, for any statement, there's a question why, and there's an answer to that question. So you can say, it doesn't change, you have to support. And uh, how would you do that? Here, this is uh, uh, what you get in the circuit. By adding an additional element, you definitely make this resistance slower. Definitely. You know? Actual values of uh, R's don't matter. They might be the same, it might be different, but if you add an additional element in parallel to this valve, you make this part of the circuit of a lower resistance. So the total resistance of the circuit decreases. Resistance uh, decreases voltage is the same. <coughs> current should balance uh, up, current increases. So <coughs> this kind of reasoning doesn't require any calculation. It requires understanding how things work. So please think about it. If you uh, wanna make this bulb, this bulb shine brighter, that's what you would do. You would close the switch. If you wanna make this bulb shine, shine dimmer, you would do it differently. You would probably have to add an additional element in series to this to decrease, uh, to increase the total uh, the total resistance. <coughs> well. Basically, we already answered the second question, but just quickly, how could we <coughs> run through numbers if we wanted? Well, what do we know? In the first circuit, this current, which starts here, travels through this bulb, and the voltage is 24. The voltage is 24. 24 is supposed to be equal to four times R, that means this bulb has a resistance, what? Six. Exactly. So here we get the same four amps. There is no bulb in this branch of the circuit. And now we can, of course, calculate everything else we need. For example, Ohm's law says three times four, the voltage across this bulb, 12 volts. Now, 24 here, 12 here, 24 and 12, what does it give us? That should give us 36 volts for the battery. If we close the switch, well, it doesn't change the voltage of the battery, it doesn't change the resistances, right? So, that 36, uh, this is 6 ohm, this is 3. <coughs> we have an additional number here, the voltage across this bulb, but the voltage across this bulb is equal to the voltage across that bulb because they in parallel. So again, we can calculate everything we need now. Well, for example, currents. This is 36 volts, and this is six. So what's going to be voltage across this bulb? This voltage plus six is supposed to be equal to 36. So this give us 30. 30 volts. Well, 30 over six on the law. Give the current. Now the current is five amps. And now it's lit. Even lit. 
five amps, six volts. Now, three ohm, six volts. What does ohm's law give us for this current? Six equals current times three. Current equals two. So two amps here. That means current splits not evenly. Total current is five. Two amps go here. So that means three amps go in that bulb. Every time when we get a piece of new information, we can use it to get a piece of new information. To get a piece of new information, etc., etc. And finally, if we know voltage and current, again, we can apply the Ohm's law. What does it give us? Now it gives the resistance, and it's going to be two ohms. So you look at the circuit. For any element, you always can apply Ohm's law. The problem is, sometimes you know already two variables. If you know any two out of three, you can calculate the third, right? But sometimes you know only one. If you look at this bulb and you don't know anything about it, well, whatever, go to the next one, to the, to the next one. Eventually you get an element for which you know two variables out of three. Apply Ohm's law, calculate the third one. That will give you uh, an opportunity to make the next step, and the next step. Well, now we're using these schematics as a bridge to a new topic. Because, as you know, a capacitor basically, when it has a charge, could be seen in a way as a battery. So, what is happening here? In this circuit, we have two batteries. And again, well, it says find everything. How would we do that? In exactly the same way. First of all, we have to state what actually do we know? Well, we know this potential equals what? Exactly. Why? Why? Because we want to, because we yeah, can. Because we only care because about we, yes, we can, we can make it zero, so we do it. We could make it million, and still it wouldn't change the final calculation. <coughs> so, zero. If this potential is zero, this potential is supposed to be what? 36. The press order. Now, wire has the same potential everywhere, so this red line represents zero potential uh, location. That's going to be zero. In that case, that's supposed to be 12. When the switch is open, this bulb is not a part of the circuit. There's nothing traveling through this bulb. So what we know is this potential is 12. This potential is 36. What does it give us in terms of the voltage across that bulb? We just have to subtract 36 minus 12, 24. Thank you very much. Next time, please, could you sit somewhere here? <laughs> 24 volts is the voltage. 8 ohms is resistance. What does it give for current? 3 amps. Now the switch is closed. What's the difference? Well, again, this potential is still zero because we want to. This potential again is zero. This is 36. This is 12. Does it change this voltage? No, in this situation, it's still 24. So that current still uh, 3, 3 amp. However, now we have an additional current. If this potential is zero and this potential is 12, the voltage across this bulb, voltage, equals 12 volts. Now, 
In which direction does current flow? <coughs> from higher, from 12 to 0, like that. Uh, and uh, how, how, how high is the voltage uh, in the current? 12 volts over 6 ohms, 2 amps. If we get 3 amps traveling towards this junction and current splits here, so 3, 2 amps, what does it give us for this current? 1, 1 amp. This battery as well as this battery doesn't have any resistance. So we cannot apply the ohm's law to a battery. However, we can use the junction rule for the junction to calculate the current with traveling through the battery. We just need to know other two currents. And here, a very similar situation. So when the switch is open, this battery is not a part of the circuit. So we have a regular circuit current travels like this, and that's it. So all we need to know is the total resistance 8 plus 6 is 14. Equivalent resistance is 14. The voltage voltage across two valves is 42. 42 over 14, 3. So the current 3 amps. But what's going to happen when we close the switch? The switch is closed. Well, now, again, it's the most convenient way is just to figure out what's happening to each potential everywhere. We set it to zero, zero. That's 42 potential. This potential is 90. So this voltage. First of all, now it drops from 90 to 42, which means the current travels from higher to lower, from 90 to 42. This current travels in this direction. And, well, 90 minus 42, what is it, uh, 48. The voltage across this bulb is 48 volts. Now we know the voltage, we know the resistance, we get the current. What about this bulb? This bulb has potential 90 here, potential 0 here. The voltage is 90 for this bulb. So the current travels in this direction through this bulb from 90 to 0. If we know two currents, we can use the junction rule to calculate the current here. It has to be equal to first current plus second current. You're supposed to have a page with schematics like that. So I would recommend you follow um, my analysis and actually keep some notes on this, just in case. Any questions? Any time. Well, let's move on to capacitors. This is the first, the easiest situation. We have only one <coughs> element, active element of the battery. We have one resistor, and we insert the capacitor here. We know for sure, in this situation, nothing is happening. The switch is open, there is no current. So, uh, that helps to eliminate some possible answers to this question. But, if we have a capacitor included, what do we say? Which of these bulbs actually are on?
Do, do you remember that big capacitor, two large plates with air between? Imagine you are an electron. So you sit on that plate and you look at the cross, the vast, you know, abyss of air. You wouldn't jump over. And you cannot run back because the battery already brought you over here. So it's been a while you've been sitting there without any motion. No motion. Charges don't move. Charges don't move. That means there is no current. There is no current. That means they both dim, both dark. Connecting the capacitor and the given, oops, that's not what I want to do. Given some time to the capacitor, oops, to get charged makes the capacitor working in the same way as a switch. It's an opening, it's a gap. Of course, in this situation, there is some voltage across the capacitor, and that voltage equals to the EMF of the battery. And of course, there is a charge related to the voltage and capacitor. But having a charge doesn't mean having a current. Because current only happens when charge changes over time. And in this situation, well, an assumption is even if something had happened, it happened a long time ago. So right now, there is no motion of any charges. And in that case, of course, nothing is happening anywhere. And, uh, well, in this situation, you would answer again that all these schematics actually equal to each other. Because, again, if the capacitor has been charged some while ago, that means that the capacitor is just a gap. And you can take it out of the circuit, this one, this one. It will not change anything in that circuit. And in this situation, the capacitor practically doesn't do anything. So when the capacitor has been charged, it doesn't do anything at all anymore. A different situation is happening when we are actually charging the capacitor. And we can look at the difference which it makes. This is a simple circuit. Well, first, there is no capacitor in it just a bulb connected to a battery. This little device just shows the direction of the curve. The battery goes to the switch, from the switch to the bulb, this. A display and back to the battery. When I close the switch, uh, the bulb goes off instantly. We know why, because electric field starts moving all electrons instantly, everywhere. And if we open the switch, current stops. What I want to do, I want to, so, I don't want to ask you this question, but I want to now insert a capacitor. This is the situation. And what's going to happen now with the capacitor inside it? You have 60 seconds to take it through. I have 60 seconds to prepare this experiment. Well, basically, I have to break the circuit, insert an additional element, which is a capacitor now, and the circuit is ready. All I have to do is close the switch. Now, this capacitor has been sitting here for days. It's not been connected to anything, so it doesn't have any charge. This capacitor is empty at this point. When I close the switch, only then something should be happening with the capacitor. And uh, depending on what is happening, well, 
what do you think should be happening? Well, capacitor, it's like a storage for a chart. It's empty now. Oh, it's like a fish, empty fish tank. It's been empty, you close the switch. You close the switch and electric field starts moving all the electrons. You look at the bulb. It instantly goes on again. There's no time. Why? Because empty capacitor, empty capacitor works like a connection, like a wire. Electrons run in that empty tank and start filling it up. Only after we wait for a while, see, this capacitor cannot accept well more charges than it can, and only after that the current stops. You see, these dots moving slower and slower and slower. If we wait for about four or five minutes. Eventually they stop. So the current still traveling through the bulb, but it's not so high anymore. It cannot make it bright. Well, let's keep it on. But at the very first instant, at the very first instant when the capacitor, capacitor was empty, it actually But that only at t equals zero, and only for empty, uncharged capacitor. So in this situation, the capacitor basically doesn't do anything bad. It works like a connect, like, like a wire connecting to things. So charged capacitor, empty capacitor, different capacitors in terms of the current. You close the switch, and current and the electrons happier to run into. The place they cannot, of course, jump over you know this uh, 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 spacing, but they still have enough space to be collected. So only when you get more and more electrons, those electrons start to repel new and coming electrons, so and eventually uh, the capacitor completely filled up. And in that case, there is no motion at all. Is it still moving? Let's wait. It should stop eventually. Well, and of course, we need to know how, but it may be going slower and slower and slower. Right? So, current is equaled by definition to amount of charge traveling per second. When charge travels slower and slower, that means current is getting lower and lower and lower. So over time, current decreases. So when we have uncharged capacitor and we close the switch, that's what is happening. <coughs> the voltage across the capacitor initially was zero. And starting from zero, the capacitor is charging up. The voltage gradually increases to some maximum value. Well, that maximum value depends on the schematics. In our simple experiment, the maximum value for the capacitor is going to be equal to the voltage of the battery. What is happening to the current? Well, at first, The voltage across the bulb jumps to its maximum value, which is again equal to the voltage of the battery. And then the voltage gradually decreases over time. But current equals voltage over R, so the current behaves in exactly the same way. These two curves turns out to be exponential curves. This is the actual experiment I've done before. Uh, if you run that particular experiment and you can fit the line, the exponential function fits perfectly. But uh, what's important is this coefficient. This coefficient tells us how fast 
something changes. Of course, for both curves, for both voltages, this coefficient is the same. It's the same circuit. <coughs> and uh, to change that coefficient, we should change something inside the circuit. What can we change? We can change either the capacitance or the resistance. Well, stop, yeah, no current anymore. What I want to do, I want to disconnect the battery at all. Instead of the battery, I can connect this capacitor. This capacitor now has some charge and its voltage actually well, initial voltage right now equals the voltage of the battery. So what's going to happen now if I close the switch? Well, first of all, we can see that the current travels in opposite direction now. But the bulb instantaneously goes on. And then the bulb gradually getting dimmer and dimmer and dimmer, and the current getting slower and slower and slower. The motion getting slower, current getting lower. So what is happening? This capacitor now is discharging. It's given away all the charge it's stored before. And for this situation, for the voltage across the capacitor, what do we have? Well, now it starts from its initial value. And now this voltage gradually getting lower and lower, decreasing over time. What is happening to the voltage and current across the bulb? Well, again, it jumps to its maximum value. However, now you see it travels in opposite direction, so it, it's negative. And again, starting from that maximum value, it's getting back to zero gradually. If we compare this number for discharging capacitor and for charging capacitor again they the same this coefficient has to be the same because we are using the same elements same C same R so again charging discharging doesn't change how fast it's happening if we want to change how fast it's happening we should change either R or C well, this is my question to you. What do you think should happen if we double the capacitance? If instead of having capacitor this one, I would use a different with capacitance twice larger than this one. And of course, so this is the situ initial situation. This capacitor is discharged completely. Actually, <coughs> if you look at the schematics, I'm going to give you a minute to answer, and I'm going to keep talking. Oops. That's zero potential terminal. This is. Uh, six volt potential terminal. So six volt, six volt, six volt, six volt, six volt, six volt here. So the wire is a conductor. Conductor has exactly the same potential everywhere without current in it. So nine 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 point six 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 this plate has a potential equal six volts. However again there is no current that means the potential inside this resistor is constant, so it's going to be six, 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 six. So for this capacitor, at t equals zero, the potential across equals six minus six, zero. The potential is six. Potential is six. However, potential difference is zero. Zero potential difference, zero charge. So this particular capacitor doesn't have any charge initially. And when we close the switch, in that case, it starts accumulating the charge. 
the question was, is it going to be accumulating faster or slower relative to the previous situation? And your answers are uh, the most popular is 6, the maximum current is larger than before, and the capacitor charges more slowly. Okay. So, to answer this question, technically, we would have to run an experiment, and that's what we would get. <coughs> First of all, since initially the capacitor didn't have any charge, any charge, yeah? it initially, at t equals zero, its capacitance doesn't matter. You may have a huge capacitance, a small capacitance, if there is no charge, it doesn't matter. It starts being matter in the fraction of a second after we close the switch. So initially, <coughs> the presence of the capacitor doesn't matter, so it shouldn't change the initial current at t equals zero. The voltage, the initial voltage, the initial current remain the same. However, the capacitor, of course, now supposed to be charging slower because it should accumulate more charge, more capacitance, more charge, more charge, more time. So if you look at these graphs, that's what we observe. This is the voltage across the resistor is the same. Same voltage, same resistance. V over R gives current, same current. So the maximum current is the same. However, if you look at the time, it's different. This uh, curve is not so steep, you know? So it takes more time now to reach the same voltage as before. If you look at the previous picture like this, to drop from 6 to 3 takes about 3 seconds. Here, now, to drop the voltage from 6 to 3 takes about six seconds, about twice longer time. And this constant now is a half of its initial value. We doubled the capacitance, and this constant gets in half. But the time also doubled. And of course, uh, a similar situation is going to be happening when we uh, discharge the capacitance. Now, if we change the resistance, if we change the resistance, this is the situation now. If we double the resistance, it means that it's twice harder for electrons to travel through this. Now, if we look at the voltage across the resistor, again, it's the same initially. But current equals voltage divided by resistance. So if you increase the resistance, you decrease the current. So now the maximum current should be equal to a half of the original value. What about time? Well, we just said more resistance, harder to travel. So uh, it should take longer time than originally to charge the capacitor completely. And again, if we look at the data, to drop from 3 to 6 takes again about 6 seconds instead of 3, time will double. This coefficient cut in half. So this coefficient is supposed to be directly related to the time, and it is. <clears throat> we know for the fact that this is the mathematical uh, function which describes the charging and discharging. And we just said if we double the capacitance or if we double the resistance, it takes more time to charge the capacitor to a certain level. So this product has a name, we, we call it the time constant of the circuit. When we change the capacitance, when we change the resistance, we're changing time constant of that circuit. How? Well, that's how double capacitance, double time constant. Now, 
<laughs> this coefficient c is not the capacitance c. You see, this is a kind of curve. This is not. This coefficient equals to 1 divided by time constant. So if time constant goes up, this coefficient goes down. And the more convenient way to write all the equations related to charge and discharge capacitor is this. When we <coughs> close the switch, the capacitance, well, uh, the capacitor initially has no voltage because there is no charge initially. So at t equals zero, if you take any number and you raise it to zero power, it gives you one. And y minus one makes it zero. So this expression <coughs> describes mathematically this curve. The difference is, in my experiments, I couldn't start measuring it exactly at t equals zero. So in my experiment, there is some well, setup, you know. That equation, all of these equations, describe the situation when this curve starts exactly at t equals zero. So when time is zero, there is no voltage, and then voltage going eventually to the maximum value. Now, for the voltage uh, across the resistor, when time is zero, it equals to initial EMF. And then it gradually goes down to zero. And the current it always equals EMF divided by resistance. So for the current, we just have exactly the same expression. It starts from its maximum value, and then it decreases over time. And this product, RC, tells us how much time we should wait until the voltage drops. Then, well, E represents us specific number, 2.81 uh, roughly. So if you, wait, if you wait exactly one time constant, that means your final voltage is initial voltage divided by 2.81. Okay. 